As usual, I'm going to talk about the Anglo-Boer War of 1899-1902, but with a slight difference. Normally I talk about a rifle with a name on and try and target that particular person and tell a story about uh, the person or the soldier or the, uh, the burger. Uh, what I'm planning to do today is to have an overall view, uh, a broad overall view of the rifles and carbines that were used by the Boers during the Boer War. Uh, probably have a look at the uh, rifles and carbines used by the British uh, another time. But as I said there, this is a broad overview. Uh, there are many excellent books out there that deal with the Lee Enfield rifle, the Mauser, the Mandica, it goes on and on. So with regard to specifications, the dates uh, and quantities of rifles that were made, the calibers, the lengths, uh, all that sort of stuff uh, is what I'm not going to be talking about. It's just a broad discussion about the types of rifles, as I said, used by the Boers. After the First Boer War of 1880-81, uh, the British were using the Martini Henry, which of course, as we all know, came out in 1871. Uh, the Boers captured many of those during the, uh, the three major battles of the First Boer War, and basically they fell in love with the Martini Henry. Uh, the 450, which is the calibre, um, they used many of them, they bought many of them, both the ZAR and the OBS, the um, State Afrikaans Republic, the Transvaal, and the OVS, or the Orange Free State governments, both bought uh, Martini Henry variants, both in the rifles and in the carbines. They were issued to the police, they were issued to the artillery, and obviously many of the burghers, private burghers, uh, liked the Martini as well. They were bought in all types of variants, uh, often sporting rifles. Uh, what I have here is a standard uh, military long rifle. Uh, this is a Mark III. It was actually made by uh, the Brandlin Armoury. Uh, it was a Boer rifle, but having said that, they were made by Webley, they were made by Wesley Richards. Uh, numerous uh, makers made the uh, martinis that were used by the Boers. So as I said, this is the long rifle. Um, uh, we've discussed this before, as we all know, the original coiled brass uh, cases were what were used originally with the martini. And then after Colonel Boxer came in with his um, drawn brass case, they went to obviously the drawn brass case in 577-450. Now that's the rifle. Uh, I'll talk about the, the carbine as well. Let's put that down for a minute. Um, what I have here is a Martini Henry uh, 0.577-450 carbine. This is an artillery carbine. The Boers mainly used the cavalry type carbine. <coughs> Excuse me, many of them were cut down as well, as you'll see in photographs. Uh, a lot of the OVS uh, carbines were stamped with a heavy OVS uh, on the button and also on the stock on the forehand here. Uh, but as I said, you'll see many photos of the ZAR Styles Artillery, the ZARPS VARPS using these. And uh, there are also a few photos of the ZARP, the, the ZARP Police, using the Martini Henry with a patent 76 uh, bayonet, triangular socket bayonet. Uh, the Boers didn't really, uh, they weren't normally armed with bayonets, but certainly uh, some of the police had bayonets and the artillery had some bayonets. Um, they, they weren't really into bayonets, but we'll talk about that later. So that's the Martini Henry Carbine. As I said, once again, many variants. The Boers also bought a uh, proliferation of uh, carbines made by different manufacturers, uh, Belgian, Romanian, and they were called a Firpont Martini or a four pound Martini because that was the price that they were sold to the burghers for. In addition to the thousands of Martini Henrys of various patterns uh, that were bought by the Boers, both the OVS and the ZAR, the ZAR placed orders on Wesley Richards. And this is what we call uh, a Wesley Richards improved Martini. If you look on the side of the receiver, it's got specially made for the ZAR, which we'll show you. Uh, they're very distinctive in as much as it's got a, a big hump at the back of the receiver here which compared to other martinis, um, you can pick it out straight away when you're looking at a photo. They made many of these. Uh, they were very popular with the Boers. Uh, they were very accurate uh, rifles. Um, one of the things which is interesting is on the top of the Knox form, there's a small triangle, which is a Wesley Richards uh, trademark. And inside the triangle are the dates that they were made, which was 1897, 98 and 99. So uh, it's quite interesting to actually have different models of these martinis. Many of them, like this one here, have been uh, carved with the, with the owner's name on. This has got the name of his farm, Noit Gedachs, and uh, it's also carved to the, to the name Gerba. We've spoken about this once before. 
So thousands of these Wesley Richards improved martinis were ordered by the ZAR and um, they became a very, very popular rifle, still being used at the beginning of the Boer War. Now, the next one that came along, <coughs> and you can imagine um, all these uh, dealers in the, uh, in the ZAR and, and the Free State, uh, international gun dealers were lobbying all the politicians of both the ZAR and also the ABS, uh, pressing them with different rifles, saying, try one of these rifles out, have a look at what we've now got. And one of them was this uh, Portuguese Giddies, um, uh, made by Steyr. Now it's very similar to the Martini Henry. We've spoken about this before. It's got a lever action, slightly different action as you can see. Uh, has a few attributes. Uh, it's a smaller caliber, 8mm by 60R. So 8mm versus the old 0.45 caliber for the 577 450 Martini. But being a, a lever action, although slightly different, um, it was very easy, uh, an easy transition from a Martini Henry to the Giddies. As I said, it was a smaller caliber, it could shoot further, and it was more accurate. So straight away, the, the likes of uh, Pitt Hubert, uh, Hubert, who was the Commandant General of the ZIR, who was a dedicated Martini man, loved the Martinis, and was one of the older Boers who was very uh, suspicious about these newfangled, dangled ideas of a 6.5 millimeter, 7 millimeter caliber magazine rifle. So he straight away fell in love with the Giddies, and some of them actually called uh, a Hubert Giddies. So um, very much uh, in favour with a lot of the Boers and they were still used uh, at the beginning of the Boer War. You can see many photos of, uh, of burgers there, some of them with Giddies, some of them with the ZR Martinis and probably the majority at that stage with the 7mm Mauser. Around about 1895, 1896, um, there were many gun dealers uh, from overseas who were going to the ZAR and influencing the politicians, please buy one of these rifles, our rifles are the best, and these were Manica, Mauser, Lee Medford, you name it. Now the Jamison Raid of 1896 was a complete disaster, we've talked about that before. The Boers realised that it was only a matter of time before the British were going to invade. The British and also the, the, the big mining magnets wanted the gold, that was the bottom line. So wiser heads were put together, they did a lot of trials of different rifles and they came up with the, the best rifle that money could buy. In 1896, uh, the model uh, M1895 Boer Mauser, which in, I'm holding here today in 7x57mm calibre. We've spoken about these before, as I said, the best rifle at the time that money could buy. Uh, it was a smaller calibre. Uh, a lot of the older Boers that I've mentioned before didn't like this idea of a newfangled uh, magazine rifle with a small calibre but they soon realised that this was uh, a perfect rifle. And really, at the end of the day, this was the rifle that carried the Boers for the, the majority of the Anglo-Boer War. Uh, towards the end of the war, sadly, uh, they ran out of ammunition because of the uh, supply situation, and the Boers ended up using more and more British uh, rifles, as did Lee Methods and Lee Enfields. Now, the majority of these uh, Mauser rifles uh, were with the long rifle, the long service rifle, Thousands were bought by the ZAR and also by the OVS. And I've mentioned this before, and all the OVS orders on the left-hand side of the receiver, there's a prefix OVS and a serial number, so they're very easy to recognise. There were far less uh, ordered by the OVS, something like 7,900, whereas the, the, the ZAR ordered up to 40-odd thousand of the Boer Mausers. Having spoken about the rifle, we'll now talk about the uh, Mauser Carbine. Once again, this is an M1895 Boer Mauser Carbine, uh, very similar to the rifle, 7 by 57 millimeter caliber. Uh, there were far less of these ordered than there were rifles. Only 7,000 were ordered by the ZAR, um, and they were only ordered by the ZAR, mainly for the state artillery, which is the ZAR Starts Artillery. Uh, when they ordered the, uh, the carbines, and we'll show you a photo, they came with two types of muzzle uh, Protector. This is a muzzle protector as well as a front sight protector. And the other one we'll show you is a front sight protector, which is retained by a small little pin. So, yeah, mainly for the uh, artillery, but the carbines were also widely uh, given to the, the foreign volunteers. There were approximately 2,000 foreign uh, volunteers who uh, volunteered to fight for the Boers. We're talking about the German Corps, Hollander Corps, Scandinavian Corps, etc. And they were also used by standard burghers. By the end of war, or should I say by the end of uh, 1901, um, the Boers were in a critical situation with regard to ammunition supplies. 
and that really started uh, at the end of 1900. Uh, more and more the Boers started using captured British weapons. So um, although they loved their Mausers, and uh, I, I feel it was a far superior weapon in the field, they started using uh, Lee Metford, uh, captured Lee Metfords and captured Lee Enfields. So by the end of the war, um, they estimate that the majority of the Boers still in the field were probably using uh, British, captured British weapons. Now there were two more rifles that uh, we'll discuss today that were used by the Boers uh, in much smaller numbers. One was a Krag Jorgensen, which we've spoken about before and we'll show you photos of. Um, it was very popular. There were only 331 ever purchased by the ZAR uh, and 20 carbines. Um, they were mainly um, given to politicians and also high-ranking officers. Um, there's a famous photograph of uh, Tobias Smuts with his uh, Krag Jorgensen. And as I said, uh, very, very, a beautiful rifle, lovely mechanism, unusual box magazine on the side. And then the other one, of course, is the Plaisir Mauser or Sporting Mauser. Uh, essentially, it's called a Sporting Mauser, but very often named a Plaisir Mauser or a Pleasure Mauser. Uh, it's a semi-custom built uh, rifle made by Mauser. They were all made by DWM, the ones that were sold to the Boer Republics. Um, uh, I think they're a beautiful rifle. My wife says there's no such thing as a beautiful rifle, but I disagree. I think this is a beautiful rifle and it's my pride and joy. Uh, it's got a lovely walnut stock this one has. They came with a cheek piece, or the majority came with a cheek piece. Uh, and the majority also had the silver escutcheon on this on the right hand side of the butt. Not all of them, but uh, quite often you'll find the, the name of the burger or of the officer beautifully engraved on the escutcheon. Uh, there's also checkering which you see um, around the, uh, the pistol grip and uh, a Schnabel 4 in as you can see here. Uh, not all of the Pleasure Mousers had an octagonal barrel, this one does, uh, which I'm very pleased about. I've had three of these over my lifetime and this is by far the best I've ever had. And as you can see the front sight, we've got adjustment on, on the front sight there. So beautiful rifle, semi-custom made, uh, much smaller the rear sight as you can see. Uh, most of them that I've seen have got a nice, uh, nice timber stock. Uh, as I said, this is in beautiful condition. It's difficult to believe that the burger actually took this to war. He must have looked after it like, he, like a baby because it's in perfect condition. Uh, it was obviously captured by a British officer because it went back to the UK and it's got British proof marks, we proof marks on the barrel, which is a bit of a pity, but uh, in my book, uh, it's still a lovely piece. Uh, once again, mainly favoured by Boer officers and well-heeled burghers, uh, people who, who could afford these. Um, not all of them had, as I mentioned, had the name. I can imagine that probably a burger came into town and bought the rifle and didn't have the money to have his name engraved or possibly there wasn't an engraver around. I have also seen them where they've actually been carved, the, um, the stock's been carved with the name of the burger. So there we have it. That's the story, a broad overview of the rifles used by the Boers. As I said, towards the end of the war, uh, from the end of 1900, they mainly used uh, British, captured British weapons. And uh, on my left here, to the right of the, of the uh, camera, you'll see a uh, Millenfield Mark I star. Uh, dated 1900, um, these were mainly used by the Boers towards the end. They were capturing British ammunition, capturing British rifles. So both Lee Methods and Lee Enfields were used in, in large quantities by the Boers. Uh, towards the end, the bitter enders were following British columns, attacking British columns and, you know, going when they, where the British had been, they'd go along and, and look for, for ammunition that, that had been dropped on, on the felt and pick that up and obviously captured from uh, convoys, etc. And that's about all. I hope you've enjoyed the story. Thank you.